This is a brief video on five different inflammatory vascular diseases, and this is just going to be a brief overview of five vasculitides whose idiopathic pathogenesis are related to the immune system. So vasculitides is just the plural form of the word vasculitis, and I'm going to be talking about five forms of vasculitis that come from problems with the immune system. Let's start with Takayasu's arteritis. It, this is a disease that's also called aortic arch syndrome and pulseless disease, and both of those describe the location of where this most affects the arteries, as well as one of the symptoms, which is pulselessness, since the subclavian artery is usually blocked off. The lumen of the subclavian artery uh, is, is, is blocked off and, and causes a person to not have a pulse. The blocking of the lumen of some arteries is caused by granulatomous formation. This affects medium to large arteries, and it specifically affects, as we said earlier, the aorta and its branches, like the subclavian artery. It usually presents as decreased pulse, as I mentioned a second ago. If you're blocking off the lumen of the aorta or its subclavian branches, then you're going to feel less of a pulse when you take it in the brachial artery on the arm and it mostly affects women under 40 years of age. Lastly, this, like many of the other diseases, are, is treated with corticosteroids. Next we have giant cell arteritis. This disease is also called temporal arteritis, and this gives us a clue as to some of the symptoms, as we'll see in a second. This is also caused by granulatomous formation, and the granulatomas again form in the, in the walls of the vessel, as you can see here, to narrow the arterial lumen. This lumen is smaller than it should be because of the granulatomas. This disease also affects medium to large arteries, and it specifically affects the temporal arteries. So temporal arteritis affects the temporal arteries and other branches of the carotid artery going up to the head. This presents as a headache, as you might expect, um, by affecting the temporal artery. There's also throbbing pain in the temporal region and visual impairment. So all those symptoms kind of localize the same area uh, because of a blockage in the temporal artery. This disease particularly affects elderly women more than men, and it's a fairly common vasculitis. And finally, giant cell arteritis is also treated with corticosteroids to reduce the, uh, the swelling and to reduce the lumen narrowing. Next, we have Kawasaki disease. Now, Kawasaki disease is the only one on this list that affects children, and it has some pretty unique symptoms. We're going to talk about them now. Kawasaki disease is also called mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome, and we do see a uh, mucocutaneous symptom. This is called strawberry tongue, shown in that picture here, and we do see some adenopathy. So those are two of the main characteristics. So it makes sense that mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome is another name for Kawasaki disease. It's caused by the systemic necrosis of vasculature from idiopathic immune activation. Like the rest of these diseases, it's idiopathic, but we have necrosis of the vasculature, and that's what causes the symptoms. This one affects small to medium arteries, and it affects children in particular, as we stated earlier. Kawasaki disease presents as a fever with some of the symptoms that we already talked about. Red mucosal lesions, lymphadenopathy, and you sometimes see rash. Treatment for Kawasaki disease is a bit different than the others. It takes IVIG and aspirin. Now, one of the contraindications for aspirin is a viral illness in children. So when treating Kawasaki disease with aspirin, we want to be 100% sure that the child does not have a viral-borne illness. Uh, so IVIG is usually a safe bet for Kawasaki disease, whereas if you give a child with a viral illness aspirin, uh, when you really think they have Kawasaki disease, that's putting them at, at risk for Ray's syndrome. And that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty common disease to come up on, on some standardized tests. So it might be worth knowing Ray's syndrome and its association with aspirin. But this is Kawasaki disease. Next disease we have is polyarteritis nodosa. This one's caused by type 3 hypersensitivity. And this is complement-mediated hypersensitivity, complete with neutrophil formation and all the complement proteins coming and activating. This is triggered by antibody and antigen complexes that go around the vasculature. It's pretty systemic, and they cause fibrinoid necroses. This one also affects small to medium arteries, and this one affects men more than women, particularly middle-aged men. Treatment for polyarteritis nodosa, also called PAN, is corticosteroids. And we see a heart here, 
that has some necrosis and has some has some vessels that are occluded because of the fibrinoid necroses due to polyarteritis nodosa. Next and last disease we're going to talk about is called thromboangitis obliterans, more commonly known as Berger's syndrome, perhaps. Uh, Berger's syndrome is characterized by necrosis of some of the extremities, as shown here, and it's heavily related to smoking, smoking and other tobacco use. It's, again, idiopathic, but we, we see some trends, and one of the biggest trends is smoking. Another trend is that it affects small to medium arteries, particularly in males, and it initially presents as an infarction in the distal limbs. Um, it usually causes claudication, which is just defined as pain from ischemia, pain from lack of oxygen to some of the distal tissues, to some of the extremities. As we said earlier, it affects men more than women, uh, middle-aged men in particular, and it's a rather uncommon disease. Treatment for Berger's disease is to simply stop smoking, and that usually helps resolve, reduce the claudication, the pain from the ischemia. Now, just a quick summary to help you organize these five inflammatory vascular diseases. First two that we talked about, Takayasu and giant cell arteritis, have a few things in common. They affect medium to large arteries, they affect women more than men, and they're, all, they're both associated with granulatomous inflammation. Last two, have a couple things in common. They affect men more than women. They affect small to medium arteries. So I kind of organize them down the side here to help you make these connections. And of course, Kawasaki disease is the one that affects children, both genders pretty equally. So Takayasu arteritis and giant cell arteritis, they narrow the lumen with granulatomous formation found in medium large arteries and in women more than men. And the last two, polyarteritis nodosa and Berger's disease, affect small to medium arteries, and they affect men more than women. And all five of these diseases are vascular diseases associated with inflammation. And unfortunately, the pathogenesis of all five of these diseases is, uh, is, is, is idiopathic in its origin. We find some trends, we see some, some commonalities between people who have these diseases, and that's what allows us to characterize them, but we ultimately don't know how the disease is started. So this is all we have for inflammatory vascular diseases. Thanks for listening and I hope it helped.